Good afternoon and welcome to the podium coming to you live from the Sierra Leone Broadcasting Corporation. My name is Zulaya Tuhami. The quote of the day comes from Mahatma Gandhi and it says, Learn as if you were to live forever. Coming up in this edition of the podium, today is World Literacy Day. Also on the podium, President Bill launches global fund approved grants for Sierra Leone to the tune of $157 million to fight AIDS, tuberculosis, malaria and COVID-19. And the Republic of the Sierra Leone Armed Forces dismisses female corporal for violation of social media usage of ALSLAF. Well, you can be part of the conversation by sending in your comments to the number 088-373-504. 088-373-504. This is the podium with Ms. Zulaya Tuhamid. We will be right back after the short break. Welcome back here watching the podium coming to you live from the Sierra Leone Broadcasting Corporation with Ms. Zulaya Tuhamid. Don't forget you can send your comments to the number 088-373-504. We start off the podium as today's International Literacy Day on the theme Literacy for a Human Centered Recovery Now in the Digital Divide. Since 1967, International Literacy Day celebrations have taken place annually around the world to remind the public on the importance of literacy as a matter of dignity and human rights and to advance the literacy agenda towards a more literate and sustainable society. The COVID-19 crisis has disrupted the learning of children, young people and adults at an unprecedented scale. It has also magnified the pre-existing inequalities in the access of meaningful literacy learning opportunities, disproportionately affecting 773 million non-literate young people people and adults. Well, this year we'll explore how literacy can contribute to uh, building a solid foundation for human-centered recovery with a special focus on the interplay of literacy and digital skills required by non-literate youths and adults. For more on this day and interventions made by the Minister of Basic and Senior Secondary Education on promoting literacy among young people through improved technology, I have in the studio the Deputy Director Director of School Broadcasting, Brian Ma Michael Ture, and Don Stans Davis, Head of Children's Department, Sierra Leone Library Board. Good afternoon, um, gentlemen, uh, good, good gentlemen and lady. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thanks for having me. Yes, um, as we are, you know, the world is celebrating international literacy at this point in time. The first thing we have to, you know, grasp is the fact that reading is not as, you know, fruitful as it was. So at this point in time, let me start with you, Brahma. Is it as useful and as lucrative as we want it as a country? It has been for seven years, I must say, because uh, I think we lost the culture of reading a long time ago. And that is part of the reasons why uh, the quality in our education system is kind of like struggling. And so that is something that we need to return back to. And uh, that is why we're making effort, working with the Sierra Live about to actually begin to motivate our children, more or less, the young ones, to into the culture of uh, reading, so that they can develop that wonderful uh, 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 attribute that would help them to pursue learning at uh, the higher levels. And so that's why you see us working with the Sierra Library Board to actually bring to life our libraries again that uh, have disappeared over the years. And so uh, it is only proper that uh, on a day like this, we uh, as education stakeholders can continue to talk about the relevance and importance of literacy and reading, of course. You know, when you say interventions that have been made by MBSCC, this brought my mind back to when uh, we were at uh, uh, primary school. You know, there were periods during um, the third semester, we would go to the library board to just, you know, inculcate the habit of reading. I wonder if that's been done as of now, you know, is it? Well, she will elaborate on that, I'm sure, but that's what we are exactly trying to do now, working with uh, them at the library to make sure that uh, what we have lost for the longest time uh, is now being practiced again in uh, our libraries across the country and that's why we're trying to open more and more of them working with uh, the library board to make sure that uh, 
in every chiefdom or so a library is available uh, so that kids can have access to those libraries and of course help themselves in terms of capacitating themselves to be able to read and develop the culture of reading again. You know, other interventions, uh, all in the process of inculcating reading to children, as um, World Read Aloud, when the Ministry of Basic and Secondary Education had, um, I think you call them patriots or so, they went out to classrooms and they had to read with the Ministry of Education. So at this point in time, it's not only on that particular day for it to be inculcated several days. How do you get to put that strategy in place? Well, we just concluded a program, okay. well, it will continue, that's a holiday reading program. And they were very active in that, like I said, with us as MBSSC. And that went on very successfully. I think that more or less it uh, kind of like triggered something in the kids to begin to develop that, you know, idea of uh, reading again, that culture of reading. So it went very successfully over the holiday period. And I believe it's something that we're going to continue now that we know it's very relevant to what we do. Okay, quickly, um, before I go to Don Stand, uh, I think it was last year again, a book was written by some members of the Alignant, and a lot of pictures were, you know, put into the book to ensure that they get to grab the attention of children. So how far have you gone with those books that were written? Well, we at the Ministry of Education, we have uh, a committee that usually looks at written materials and get them okay. before they eventually become part of what we do in our schools. And so I'm just looking at that, and uh, once they're vetted and they are uh, approved as being at, of a standard that can be used in our schools, obviously we would make sure that uh, they hit our schools. Okay, thank you very much, um, Brian. I will over to your stance. Now let's talk about the program that you, the Ministry of Basic Education had with the Sierra Leone Board. How fruitful was it? Okay, thank you very much. Um, it was very fruitful, very um, successful. It was very successful. Um, the program was launched in June, and then it kick-start um, when school closed down. Um, we encourage all the school children to come into our libraries, uh, not just in Freetown, but right across the country, because presently the Southern Library Board has um, branch and regional libraries all over uh, 16 big states. So all of these libraries were involved in this holiday reading program called Reading Season Reading Program. And at the start of it, we immediately noticed that a large number of um, children began to come in in the, uh, in the morning hours from 9 and they will be in the library till 5 p.m. when the children's department closes down. So there was a huge turnout. And the most interesting part of the reading program was that we selected our own local books. We selected five local books, you know, written by our own local authors for um, five different levels, which are the ECD, that's the early child development, the lower primary, that's from classes one to three, the upper primary, which is classes four to six, then the GSS one to three, and then the SS one to three levels. So all of these books were grouped into these different levels so the children could read them by levels. And then during the reading program, we not just only read the books to them, we encouraged the children to also read these books for themselves because um, they have to learn how to pronounce the words, they have to develop their vocabulary. And then we also went on further to conduct tests on the books. So two um, tests were conducted from the start to the end of the reading program. Where we were able to select um, best readers at the end of the day. So I should say that the program was a very successful one. Okay, so on a normal day, how cool is the library? Just to know. Okay, uh, well, on a normal day, we do have children coming in in the morning hours, but basically those are children who have not started school yet, so they are few. But then in the afternoon hours when school closes down, we have more numbers coming in um, after school to spend time reading until they're 
parents pick them up in the evening hours. Okay, let's go to another area. Yeah, the issue of cognitive learning is, is very, yeah, you know, peculiar in arts classrooms. You get to see a lot of uh, um, chill teachers get to pass on the information of, uh, in quotes, cramming. They get to regurgitate most of the time. And when it's exam, they get to put it out. And some form of learning is not passed on. So when you, you at the library get to you know, sit with these children to actually let them be able to read and pronounce well and actually digest what they have been reading. What are some of your strategies you get to put in there? Okay, um, we have different strategies including, um, first of all, we allow them to, to um, express themselves. We allow them to explain to us what they've understood from the readings they do. So we normally set up um, simple competitions, you know, for them to Tell, to retell the stories to us because that's when we can be able to tell that you really understood what we just read to you or what you just read yourself. So we encourage them to retell the story. We encourage them to also act out the stories in drama titles. So that's um, some of the strategies that we use. Okay, now let's talk a little bit of drama that you get to implement. Um, that, that's, you know, to some ex large extent get to draw the attention because you get to have plays and the like. So what are some of the drama you get to hold there? Okay. Interestingly, today as we are celebrating the um, International Literacy Day, one of the activities performed by the kids themselves was a short drama on a book titled Typical Day of Baby Aggie. This is one of the books um, during the rainy season reading program. So what we encouraged them to do was to have um, a child reading out the words and then we have those who are acting out where the child is reading. So this is just one form of dramatization. Where in, um, um, a child is reading out the story and then we have the silent actors just doing the actions. Yeah, that's just one. Okay, thing. let me take you to something very interesting. Um, as of now, do you get to, you know, allow children to leave out, um, to leave the land with the books? Because that's also another issue. Many a time they get back with the books and they're turned out and the likes. Yeah, we do because definitely um, we can't do much in the library. A lot also has to go on in the home. So that is why we have strategies in place to ensure that the kids take the books home. So as a library, we have a system wherein we give out um, up to four books for two weeks, for a two-week period. Um, that's why in the first place we have these children registered in the library. So that means we have all your details, your records of your address, your parents, and telephone numbers. So when we give out a book to a particular child, we can be able to monitor and trace um, the use of this book. And then, like I said, we give it to you for a time period of two weeks. So we are expected to return the books in, in the two weeks period. If not, we can be able to trace you back to your home or um, reach out to your parents so that you can bring back our books. And also, I guess you, we all, um, at the start of it, during registration, we orientate them you know, to teach them how to handle the books, handle them with care. We tell them that books have lives, they can breathe, you know, so you have to take good care of them. And in a case where accidents do happen, they will spill drink on it, or maybe a page is torn, we have um, facilities to fix up the books, but also we normally give a little fine, you know, so that you won't do it next time. Okay, uh, in terms of reforms that have been made at the TLU Library Board, um, let's take into cognizance what you're giving at this point in time, or other forms of you know improvements that have been made there. Tell us some of them. Yeah, um, um, like um, my colleague here was saying just now, the ministry has really been working assiduously with the library. So during this holiday period, in fact, the books I'm telling you about that we have selected were also done in audio format and PDF as well. So these audio books are also out there in case you can't access the physical books themselves, you can access the audio books. It's on the ministry's um, website and we also shared it, we spread it out to different forums on social media. So most parents have access to these audio books now that you can actually listen to. Okay, thank you very much, Constance. And over to you, Abuja uh, Michael. Um, this afternoon, you know, we're talking about literacy and the role of teachers here is very important. You know, a lot of pressure has been put on when kids are in school and when they go home, not much, you know, is been realized because a lot of pressure has been put on them. So what would you see in that area? So that, that is the, that's the part where we have the most pressure, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. You know, the role that is supposed to be played by parents is not being shifted to the Ministry of Education. 
Like for example, a parent would let a child go down to the beach late at night and then come early in the morning, three o'clock, and they open the door for that kid who is supposed to be there studying in the home, but they have gone out and they came back early in the morning and they have to go to school the next the morning, the few, few hours from that from that time. And when they fail, it's the Ministry of Education that's being blamed for that. So parents also have to know that they have a role to play, a very big responsibility. We only have these kids for a few hours in our schools. The rest of the time, they are out there with the parents. You know, but when a parent has to leave the house at 5 a.m. to go down and sell some whatever it is to make ends meet, and the child is left all day, parents don't know what's happening to that child, then that creates a problem. You know, we have this limited time. So parents have to understand that they have the bulk of the time with the child at home. And also, it's also an attitude thing. Now it's free quality education. Now I've had parents say, no parents go read the book here. In fact, when you fail, and you have a government thing. If you don't read and you fail, well, I don't even care because I'm not one thing. It's government thing. Well, you would be the first beneficiary if that child should succeed. You, the parent, not the government. And so you should be the number one person to let that child know that it's important for him or her to actually be serious with his, his or her education, not the government. The government is only playing its role by providing what it is able to provide for that kid. The rest, it is you, your responsibility as a parent. So we have a challenge there, and it's a very serious one. Okay. It's a very attitude thing. Let's take a discussion to the better results that are now out. And a 13% increase in examination passes in English was realized at this point in time. And all of that was to reading comprehension. And you know, there's this oral um, exam they get to sit at worst level. So this is all in terms of preparation to um, upcoming exams. So in that area, oral uh, um, exams and actually starting that at a very tender age to learn how to pronounce correctly. What does the minister intends to do in that area? Well, we just continue to, to build on the successes that we have actually registered over the, 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 the few years that we have been actually registering this progress in our public examinations. A lot of things have been happening in our public examinations, examination practice here and there, but over the last few years at least we have been able to address sufficiently enough some of those problems and as you can see, our numbers are increasing in terms of our passwords and all of that. But nevertheless, we still continue to do what we're supposed to do. Coming back to encouraging our kids from the very start, even in our ECD programs. Now it's the playway method. It's not the old method of get, getting a book to a child and then have that child memorize everything in that book and then we think that is the best way of learning. No, it's the playway method allows the child to innovate, allows the child to use his or her own initiatives and innovation to develop something with themselves and out of what they can actually do that. So that is also a very important approach to our learning uh, processes that we are introducing and that we are encouraging our schools to actually continue. Okay, let me take you to the word of the day that the ministry normally does on a daily basis. Children get to subscribe and see, of course they get to learn a new word every day. So you know in terms of statistics, how effective is that? It is very effective for the simple fact that it's not just the children who are actually learning, getting information through that. A dictionary in your hands can be used by anyone. Adults can use that to check a word, the meaning of a word. So it's not just our school going population. So it's very effective. And it's there and it's available. We never had that before, but now we do. Now you can check your child's, uh, what, what they call it, uh, examination results. Yes, a new system has its challenges. We agree. You know, sometimes people will complain that, oh, I don't get the results on time. Well, that's because if you have hundreds of thousands of people calling a system at one time, you get clogged. And so clogged up, and so you would have to wait at a time that's not peak time, and then you'll get what you want. But we are improving that, and I'm sure as we go, it would improve, and it's only a matter of time people will begin to see that the systems we are putting in place are actually working and they are giving the benefit that we actually want to see them be loved. Okay, still in that area, I don't stand. In terms of, you know, using the correct word and the pronunciation of the right word and also using the dictionary, how do you get to um, cope with that? Because many times children get to tell you, oh, that's how my aunt says I should pronounce this. And when you go home, your mom says, no, that's not the way. <laughs> so how do you get to cope with all that? <laughs> I know. Um, well, that's a very interesting aspect of teaching the children. Because like you're saying, we have various pronunciations 
um, even our local language getting the way of the way we pronounce our words. But um, the right thing is the right thing, the right, the right way. So we try to teach them and try to instill the right um, pronunciation. Then, so we have the books. You know, we have other audio materials so that they, can, they themselves can listen. Some of the books, in fact, that we have in the library come with their audio tapes. So we play this. Um, tape so then they can listen and confirm that this is the right way to pronounce this one. So it doesn't matter whether auntie in school says this or mommy says this at home, but um, what's the right way is the right way to follow. It. Okay, in moving forward now, today's little incident will be another day. What are some of, you know, the in, the um, other areas you see people at the library apart from decentralization? Um, we also seek to improve um, the reading and learning methods in schools. That's why we are not only engaging the children, but we also normally engage the schools as well. We engage the school authorities, the teachers. So most of the time we have school visitations, we have monitoring exercises, we have a reading promotion programs that we take to the schools. So in that way we can also be able to influence the schools because we can't do it all in the library and also the home can do it all. It's all three coming together. So we ensure that we engage the school authorities so that we can all achieve the one goal. Okay, I see you want to come in that. No, well, yes, it's just, uh, just uh, affirming what she's saying that uh, that's what we mean. That's the reason why we're very excited this time around that for the first time in a long time we're capacitating them and we're working with them, you know, collaboratively to promote all of the things that are we want to see happen for our kids in this country and so they've been doing a phenomenal job in terms of maintaining our libraries across the country and we can only say thank you for that very wonderful partnership with them. Okay, thank you very much for taking your time to talk to us this afternoon. Um, he's mm -hmm. Michael Tsui, um, the Deputy Director of School Broadcasting and uh, Don St. Davis, Head of Children's Department, Sierra Union Library Board. Be reminded that you can send your comments to number 088 Continue with the podium live on the Sierra Union Broadcasting Corporation. Now, President Julius Madabio has announced the Global Fund approved grants for Sierra Union to the tune of $157 million to fight AIDS, tuberculosis, malaria, and COVID-19. Sierra has benefited from three global fund, um, funds, new funding model, and recently the board approved $125 million for AIDS, TB, and malaria, and additional $31 million to prevent the effects of COVID-19, which will run from 2021 to 2024. The Ministry of Health and Sanitation and the Catholic Relief Service will implement the funds with targeted beneficiaries to um, of pregnant women, under five children, sex workers, youth, um, prisoners, and people affected by these diseases. Leon Toka is the country the coordinator, Global Fund co Country Coordinating Meca Mechanism, Sierra Leone Secretariat, and from the Catholic Relief Service, Paul Ames. Good afternoon, gentlemen, and thank you for joining us on the podium. Yeah, good afternoon. Yes, let me start with you, Leon Toka. Uh, the global Talker. fund, yes, LinkedIn Talker, the global fund country coordinating mechanism. First of all, these are huge amounts of money. What does this mean for the country? Uh, it means a lot. It's a big money for Sierra Leone. And uh, we came up with that amount based on inclusive uh, proposal development process, including all the key stakeholders. So we didn't just come up with that figure. We come up with that figure based on what we are supposed to implement. And in these areas, what would be it? And for you know, for instance, the the awareness being raised about AIDS, not you know, is still at the peak. But uh, you know, the people actually coming forward to say that they actually have it is also another area. So how are you going to put in strategies to ensure that yes, these uh, um, you know factors such as stigmatization is at least? Yeah, um, uh, actually, um, we have two principal recipients. Okay. That is Ministry of Health and Sanitation and Catholic Relief Services. Catholic Relief Services will be engaged purely in behavioral change communication to communicate with all the people of this country on the fight against uh, malaria and TB. Our Ministry of Health should handle the fight against HIV, TB, and malaria. So okay. it's more on sensitization. We have to intensify that one and make sure we include all the key stakeholders 
including these people also, the chiefs, the youths, everybody, even the, the people living affected by the disease should be part of this campaign. And you'll be taking this to even prisoners. I'm a little bit... Yeah, even the prisoners, yeah. The, pri the prisoners, the prisoner, you know, I mean, these are close settings, and we have organizations who will be working with them to make sure that they get what is meant for them to fight the disease, you know. So don't leave them out. We still care for them. They are part of the beneficiaries of this grant. Okay, thank you. Very much. You're welcome. Yes, let me go over to Paul. At this point in time, uh, the Catholic Relief Service will have been implementing partners, yeah. yes. And you have been working on health-related issues. And let's start with AIDS. Mm -hmm. You know, what are some of the, the, the strategies, again, you're going to put in place to, to facilitate this? The, um, the HIV AIDS component is mostly going to be managed by the Ministry of Health. Um, CRS will be focusing mostly on malaria, tuberculosis and the fight against COVID. Okay. Um, but with regard to AIDS, we will be working closely with the Ministry of Health and the non-governmental organisations that will be implementing HIV programmes. And we'll be looking mostly at capacity building and health system strength. Okay, you know, for the provinces, malaria is uh, kills a lot in those yeah. areas. And you know, there are times the government get, the government gets to put in all of these measures, such as um, um, net tents to ensure yeah. that they get to use it. But sadly, that's not always the case. Yeah. So, how are you going to use these funds to ensure some of those projects? I mean, for us, these, this funding is an enormously exciting opportunity. Malaria is devastating for Sierra Leone. We have one of the highest burdens of malaria in the world in this country. Um, it's, one of, it's the highest cause of death for children. And the, in some parts of the country, 40% of the population tests from positive for malaria on any given day. Um, it has economic and a health effect which is terrible. We see this grant, this award from the Global Fund as an opportunity to step up the fight against malaria, to work with our partners and specifically to work with the ministry and with the communities to encourage them to sleep inside uh, an impregnated bed net, to recognise what malaria is and how to avoid it what are the symptoms and what to do if you are uh, if you think you have malaria go to a clinic get tested get treated the the message is relatively simple and straightforward but actually getting people to sleep inside a bed net when they're given one is a challenge you know people say ah it's hot we don't like you know we want to use the net for something else so it's, it's all for us, it's all about behaviour change communication. We're out there, we're working with partners, with school health clubs, with community health clubs, with the primary health system, and, and we're working on the behaviours which prevent people from protecting themselves in order to change their behaviour and improve their health status. Okay, the school health clubs you get to work with, um, what have you been doing so far with them? Because I can recall a few years back when I was in school <laughs> as well, you know, like they went there, they had to give us some of these tablets, and the first yeah. thing I did, I had to call my mom, should I take it? That was first thing. <laughs> yes, so how are you going to ensure that, yes, you get to speak with principals, make the children feel yeah. safe to actually take them? It's a very interesting point because behavior change it's it's all about acceptance and understanding it's the same with the covid vaccination you know people hear all kinds of nonsense on social media and unfortunately they believe it in you know in many many cases and the same goes for malaria you know you're a child somebody gives you a tablet or tells you you should go and seek treatment in the clinic and who do you trust it could be anything so who do you talk to you talk to your religious leaders your traditional leaders, your parents, um, the head teacher. And, and that's why we focus so closely on community outreach and on the health clinics and on the schools and on the faith leaders and traditional leaders because those are the people that, that are asked, you know, is this safe? Can I do this? And, and if, if, we can, if we can make that breakthrough where, where people who are trusted in the community will say to the children and the mothers and the fathers and the brothers and the sisters, yes, it's safe. 
this could save your life. Then you make the breakthrough. And now you're targeting faith and religious leaders that, you know, this brings to back memories as well. These are very important people, especially the religious leaders. You yes. get to speak to them and, you know, they get to pass on the message. Yes. So how would you do that in terms of, you know, negotiations and meeting with them? So, I mean, through a variety of methods. I mean, we, we have a, a network of, um, of school clubs. Uh, we have... Um, a, a, a network across the entire nation um, through the primary health system through the um, through a partner called focus 1000 okay. they they have a network called the Combra network which has a nationwide um, reach to religious and traditional leaders and through that network we're able to pass those messages through the churches through the mosques through the village community meetings um, to explain to people the very simple messages about how to avoid these diseases, what to do if, if they get them, and how to make themselves safe. You know, um, Nakova, I'm sure you're aware yes, of yes, Nakova, yes. yes, has been working the tremendous to ensure that people get vaccinated at this point in time, but actually the number of people since going there is actually yeah. slow. <clears throat> so would you have in, do you have intentions to collaborate with Nakova to yeah. ensure that, you know, people actually come on board? So I met with the director of NACA only last week and we had an extremely useful conversation. Um, the percentage of vaccinated people in this country um, is around 2%. Um, and there are basically two reasons for that. One is a lack of vaccines and the other one is a lack of acceptance by the community. Now, what we will be doing with um, regard to the lack of vaccines is we will be talking you know, with the Ministry of Health, but particularly with the donors, to encourage them to make donations of vaccines to, um, to, to Sierra Leone. And I, I was very interested speaking with um, a colleague from the United States Embassy this morning who said that another consignment of vaccines is coming in from the US, which is extremely welcome. But the, the even if the vaccines were all available, relatively few people are willing to go and get vaccinated. I'll say publicly, I've been vaccinated, I'm still here. It, it is safe. To the people that are on, I would say, please get vaccinated. This could save your life and save the lives of, of those that you love. Okay. Um, in the area of the additional $31 million to prevent the effect of COVID-19, which will run from 2021 to 2024, yeah. I'm sure you'll be part of that as well. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah, so this, you know, it has been stated that COVID will have to, will have to live with COVID-19. So, you know, in terms of working till 2024, yeah. long-term plans to ensure that, yes, you get to, you know, actually see all of these implementations mm -hmm. put for. Yeah. I mean, uh, sadly, it looks as if we're going to have to live with and manage COVID. I mean, I, I think in the early days, there was a hope that we could just defeat it. Now it seems that we will have to manage it. But we do, um, we do follow the science and we do believe that uh, with a combination of vaccination and safe practices and, and the slow build-up of natural immunity, we will be able to manage this very, very damaging disease. So far, thank goodness, Sierra Leone has been relatively spared from the worst ravages of COVID-19. We want to keep it that way. Okay, thank you very much for taking your time to talk to us. And um, Mr. Toka, now you're here this afternoon and on the area of the $31 million to prevent the effects for, of COVID-19, which will run from 2021 to 2024 and CLS in the implementing partners. Tell us about, you know, that um, decision. About the... The decision to work with them. Yes. yes. Um, um, usually, you know, we, the CCM, the country coordinating mechanism, is responsible for nominating the principal recipients of those grants. So Ministry of Health and uh, CRS, we are nominated and endorsed by the Global Fund. Now we expect them now to work with the current SRs, we mean sub-recipients, okay. to make sure they, 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 they implement this program using that money, that $31 million. CRS will be having um, about $6 million. 
whereas uh, the Ministry of Health, we have about $15 million. Okay, and the idea of the sub recipients, uh, what do they actually mean by apart from CIS? Are there other recipients apart from them? Yeah, when we have uh, the principal recipient, the principal recipients receive the fund. Okay. And they have to disburse to the sub recipients, I mean NGOs, organizations, people living and affected by the disease organizations, you know. They send this money to them for them to implement based on the proposal we developed. And as well as we go around to monitor, CCM will provide oversight to make sure that these things are happening. We get the targets. In terms of the NGOs that will serve as uh, sub recipients, as you call them, um, are we able to ensure that um, the petition of the same activities is not actually done? Yeah, that is the work of the PR, principal recipient. Okay. So in the first place, before even giving them the money, they need to have a workshop, build their capacity sensitize them on their, on their activities, the proposal, what they are supposed to do. And we we'll make sure we don't have duplication because we we'll have, we we'll look at the geographic contiguity wherein this SR should be in the north, this should be in the south, you know. Okay, thank you very much, gentlemen. You are heartily welcome. Yes, thank you so much for taking your time to talk to us. You are watching the podium live on the CLU Broadcasting Corporation with me, Zulaya Suhami. Don't forget you can send your comments to the number 088-373-504. We're going for a short break. We'll be right back. Then call them Scratch and Win. Scratch and Win? Yes. I can win easy for play. I can make you be millionaire with just one big ticket where you go buy. So buy you Scratch and Win ticket and find out if you like the next millionaire. You go win 50 million, 100 million, and up to 500 million euros. 500 million euros? Now, make a show now. How for play this game? When you buy tickets, Scratch the sign will say game zone and scratch here. You will see the same sign and number there. But if you fail to say, you see three of the same sign or number them. Now you ticket. Just me say normal now. You don't win that prize day. But turn the ticket over to the second side for fellow to prize where you win by the sign or number them. Well, now you that was waiting. How we go get waiting we win? show you ticket to any scratch and win agent and quick quick one it will give you your money where you win sky you lock and say not if you the next millionaire with this scratch and win instant I don't care I don't care I don't care because you know the end Welcome back. You're watching the podium coming to you live from the Serbian Broadcasting Corporation with me, Zulaya to Hamid. Don't forget you can send your comments to the number 0883735504. Now, as the Premier League is about to um, reopen, I have with me Mohamed Jawad Niali, who is a member of the Premier League Board Media, is here to tell us more. Good afternoon, Mohamed Jawad Niali, and thank you for joining us on the podium. You're welcome. Yes, let's start with the vaccination process in all of this force. You know, uh, Nakovac ruled out that yes, players as well as participants should be vaccinated. Take us through the process in the area of the players. So, um, football has stopped and the reason why football stopped is because of safety issues. And we're saying football should resume again once we ensure that everyone, footballers, official fans, are all coming back into the stadiums in a safe environment. So it was very important for us to ensure that players get vaccinated. We are also encouraging fans to be vaccinated. Officials are also being vaccinated. Because what, what basically NACOVAC told us, knowing the importance of football at this moment, is that um, you can go back to the stadium and you can resume. But it's very important for fans to be vaccinated if they want to come and watch. And so players being not just players, they are also role models in society. A lot of the boys, the fans are looking up to them. So they have taken the responsibility to come forward, take their vaccines. Officials are also taking their vaccines. So what we are seeing now, in effect, is that um, in the last few weeks, teams have been rallying behind their fans to get vaccinated because the more fans, vac the more fans come out to get vaccinated, the more of them can get access to different venues across the country to watch the game. Say, for example, if FC Cologne is playing Eastern Lions now, and you only have 20 FC Cup vaccinated, then you're only going to have 20 fans in the stadium. 
which is going to be bad and it will be detrimental to the revenue generation drive for clubs. And for us, um, football, the reason why it's important for us to play football, we're back into the Africa Cup of Nations for the first time in 25 years. So meaning, back home here, we have to play competitively to make sure the boys back home here are fit and ready if the national coach needs them to get drafted into the main squad ahead of January, Africa Cup of Nations in Cameroon. And so it just doesn't make sense if football is not playing. But like I said, whilst we have the urge to get back out there and compete and play and entertain everyone, we also have the responsibility to make sure the game plays on a safe environment for everyone. Okay, so um, fans and spectators will be asked to show their vaccination cards. Is yeah. that what you're saying? Yes, yes. For now, that's the procedure. Um, fans, um, in some places, it's going to be a little bit difficult for us to control it, mm -hmm. but we are putting every mechanism in place now to ensure that it's done. Because like we said, we don't want football matches to be super spreader events. It will be we will be reversing all the gains we've made as a country in the last in the last few months. June we recorded the highest amount of cases, more than a thousand cases in June alone. So we do want to get back to that. So I'm not saying football contributed by the way, but um, we want to ensure that we play our own part responsibly. Okay, let's not shy away from another issue, Jawad. Um, the issue of violence during this Premier League. Mm. You know, what's your collaboration with the Sierra Leone Police, for instance, to ensure that the sanity is maintained? Yeah, um, collaboration has been good. And, and, and just a quick correction there. Um, we've seen sporadic incidents, so it hasn't been a widespread reported cases of violence. And so, Last from last season, in fact, in the last two years, even we've stopped the league, we've restarted it. Um, the league has not been characterized by violence because fans know better now. Okay. They know it will come with stiff punishments for their teams, and so they've been likely well behaved. Of course, we've had few incidents, but these are just minor incidents. And regarding security, security is always tight in all the venues where Premier League matches are playing. We're not just relying on on, on state security, which are the police or the military, depending on the on the occasion. But we're also relying on club marshals, which we've seen some clubs have invested in that, have marshals across. And when they say these big hyper matches, they come, they, they come with them and ensure that sanity is kept. And that has largely been, so the league has largely been very, very peaceful. Okay, games have not been played for a while now. So let's talk about the creation of this Premier League board. How prepared can we see they are? Well, we are very, very prepared. We are as prepared as we can be. And uh, for teams, teams have been busy. Even in the last 24 hours, some teams are signing new coaches. Mighty Blackpool appointed a new chairman yesterday. So behind the scenes as well, they are doing a lot of transfer business at the moment. So clubs are ready. Everyone is ready. We've all missed football. I mean, I said to my friends, um, when the league is playing at 5, 6 p.m., when we, we are off from work, we just we just go to the National Stadium, relax, enjoy football for two hours before we go home. So this is a country that adores football. So we're ready. We're all hyped. And we know it's going to be great again. I mean, um, had it not been for COVID-19, by now we will have been wrapping up the first half of the league. I mean, we just played a few games. We played 105 games, and just that 105 games we scored around 76 goals, 77 players involved in all of those goals. So that shows you the promise, it shows you the potential. And just the short time we used to play, um, it gave the national team coach a lot of scope, a lot of option to pick um, to pick a very good side, of course, which eventually took us to have a cup of nations. So, we're ready. We're ready. Fans are excited across the country. You know, speaking of promise and the potential of these players, you know, the welfare of them cannot be emphasized. So, let's now talk about the welfare of those players. Do you think we are the right foot in that? Well, welfare is not really on the Premier League board. Okay. It's down to the management of teams, individual management of teams. Yes, with the COVID-19 situation, it, uh, it has affected everyone from the economy of the country itself to, to footballers, to team administrators, and they are still part of this economy. So that is why we've always been pushing that when football plays, everyone eats because um, whether it's the market woman coming to the stadium to sell some drinks or whether it's fans going to the games and buying a ticket, 10,000 euros, and that revenue goes back to teams 
and teams can use that to pay their players. So it's very possible. So that is how it, there is a whole ecosystem around that. So the solution is football to start playing. And once it plays, then those welfare issues will gradually be solved. Okay, in the area of the fans, you know, apart from the fact that they have to show their vaccination cards, what would you have to say to them in terms of violence? Because most times they are, are the perpetrators. Yes, so I know football is a very emotional sport. Mm -hmm. And, and when, 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 when your team is playing, um, if they lose the ball or there's a foul or the ref, you think the ref made a bad call, you're going to shout, you're going to scream. But we've always said just keep that in check a bit because at the end of the day, the, the, the referee is, is a human, is bound to make mistakes, or your players might not just be informed. So keep it in check and remember why we're all there. We're all there to get formed, to enjoy the game, fair play. That's the motto. So we've constantly said that. And teams are now investing as well in, in ensuring that they educate their fan base around um, peace and the, the, the essence of cohesion and the essence of avoiding violence in match venues. Because imagine if you are making, every time you have a home game, you are making something like 20 million in fan revenue. And then um, your fans are at the wrong end of a violent situation. Then eventually we take a decision, say, uh, um, your fans will no longer be allowed in the stadium. For three matches, you're going to lose 60 million. So there are also financial consequences that teams are looking at. And so now fans are more educated and they are now more responsible enough. Okay, what would you say to preparations for that from 2022 in all of this, if there's any? Well, um, like I said, this is like a dress rehearsal for us as a nation. So the more competition the local voice gets, the more fit they will be, and the more option it will give the national coach to look. Don't forget, we still have COVID-19 across the world and traveling regulations are changing every now and then. It's so unpredictable. And by the time we may get to January, I mean, already during this year, there was a time when the national team coach needed players for starting friendly. He had to pick largely home-based squad because up to nine or eight of his players that he wanted, they were not available because of restrictions, traveling restrictions. So these are all the circumstances we are under at the moment. So that is why it is now more than ever more so important for the league to play because it will be a dress rehearsal for the main events in January. Okay, finally, what would you say to those footballers? Well, footballers go out there and play. On Saturday, we have some exciting line of mouth matches um, in Bow, in Freetown here, in Mackey, in Pope Lockup. So, um, fans, I'm sure as well, fans are queuing up in, in some parts of the country to be vaccinated as well, to be part of those money. So, we're all excited. Go out there and have fun. And on the Saturday, what are the, will be the first sets of match? So, um, in, in Bo, for example, we have Eastern Tigers playing against Bo Rangers, and Bo Rangers are staking their claim. They want to win the, the, the championship for the very first time. Freetown City Council is playing Mount Rest Leaf ahead. Police are playing Eastern Lions on Saturday evening at the National Stadium. By Grey Wars, they are playing all the audience at Pope Loco. So we have all of those games. Okay, thank you very much. Mohammed. I hope to see one of them. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> all right, you're welcome. Thank you very much, uh, Mohammed Jawad Nelly, for taking time to talk to us this afternoon. Well, as we round up the program, I still have with me um, Linton Toka, the country coordination. Coordinator Global Fund County Coordinating Mechanism Sierra and from the Catholic Relief Service Paul Ems. As we round up the program now um, to Mr. Topper, what do you expect to see at the end of the soul come 2024? I want to see um, a great success in the fight against HIV, TB, or malaria, and even COVID. And also we want to see the health system being improved, you know, strengthened, so that you know uh, the programs can go on well. And we are looking at sustainability. Okay. Because we should not be just be asking donors to give us money. So once that time in country partners, you know, to come on board and say our best domestic funding for this grant in fact, the government is going to give some fund. Okay. Our seven with five percent of the one hundred and twenty five million dollars. So you see, so I have to give say thank you to the government of Sierra Leone for really coming on board to see that the people of Sierra Leone are more safe in the fight against HIV, TB, and malaria, and even COVID-19, which has serious effect on the gains we've made so far. Okay, thank you very much. And over to you, Paul, as an implementing partner. Mm. What do you hope to do, you know, by the end of 2024? 
I would like to see by the end of 2024 a strong Ministry of Health, an even stronger Ministry of Health. Uh, we're aiming to uh, work with them on um, a capacity building um, mechanism and process whereby the Ministry identifies areas where they meet, may need technical support. We will be handing over um, a, a lot of our work over those three years. Um, we'll be working with our civil society partners and our NGO partners and with the communities. And I would like to see by 2024 stronger communities and stronger civil society fighting against these diseases. Okay, thank you very much, gentlemen. And that's how we we'll bring an end to this edition of the podium. Remind you, a quote of the day comes from Mahatma Gandhi, and it says, Learn as if you were to live forever. Many thanks to my producer, Salmataba. My name is Zulaya Tuhamid. Continue to watch the SLBC, and have a good afternoon. Bye-bye.